All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so used to saying good morning. I already almost missed the one. Welcome to the Clean Lakes Alliance 101 Science Cafe, or as we're calling it today, of course, Frozen Lakes 101. I'm Dana Fulton, a swim track 27 meteorologist at WKOW, and our station, as you've heard, it's a very proud sponsor to be the media partner for these events. Um, I'd like to welcome all the people that are here today that braved the slush and the fog to come on in. We're in Frozen Assets Week this week, and today our topic, of course, is very appropriate. It's titled, What's Under the Ice? And the talk will look at exactly that, what's happening in our lakes during the winter. We'll learn about unique physics, chemistry, and biology of our lakes during the winter and what a warming climate means for the future of our beautiful resource. We will have time for a Q&A session at the end of the talk, and I was asked to remind everybody we'll try to keep the Q&A session close to that hour cutoff because we can still talk and ask questions at the bar in the happy hour. So that's an option I have to raise too, but we'll try to get as many questions as possible in at the end of this presentation. So before we start today's talk, I want to introduce Ann Steppenfield from Temple Madison to give us a few more updates about Clean Lakes Alliance, as well as tell us more about today's speakers. Thank you, Dana, and thank you to everyone who is here joining us at the Edgewater. Um, as Dana said, I'm Ann Sappenfield. I'm the Vice President of Temple Madison, and Temple Madison is proud to be sponsoring this event today. Temple is a group of over 200 current and retired executive women in the Madison area. Uh, our model is to lead, connect, and engage. And I think what we're most proud of is the scholarships that we award to college freshmen who graduate from high schools here in the Madison area. And last year, we awarded almost $12,000 to six young women who are currently freshmen in college who graduate from high school um, in the area. So we're really proud to be able to help them get started on their careers. I'd also like to thank the other um, Green Lakes Alliance 101 Science Cafe sponsors. Presenting sponsor, First Weber Foundation. Hosting sponsor, The Edgewater. Joining Align Energy as a supporting sponsor is National Guardian Life Insurance Company. And production partners are UW Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies and the UW Extension. And as Dana said, we're also happy to have WKOW as a media sponsor. We're at the start of um, Frozen Assets Week, which is presented by the Associated Bank and the Edgewater. After today's talk, we invite you to stick around for a happy hour up at Audie's Tavern, which is on level seven. And um, everyone should have received a ticket when they were checking in that will allow you to um, receive a free beverage of your choice between five and six o'clock tonight. Also, at the end of the week, don't miss the Frozen Assets Festival um, from 10 o'clock to 3 o'clock here at the Edgewater. Activities include Madison's largest winter workout, large snow kites, snow kites, skydivers, free hot chocolate, free skating, kids' activities, and more. So to talk, to get back to today's talk, we are excited to have both Dr. Harry Duggan and um, from the UW Center for Limnology and Dr. Zach Feiner from the Wisconsin DNR and the UW Center of Limnology present today's talk. Dr. Duggan is an associate professor at the Center for Limnology. She has studied how ter terrestrial and atmospheric changes such as warming air temperatures or lane patterns alter our lakes. Her research fo focus is temperate and polar lakes with sites standing from Wisconsin to Antarctica. Dr. Zach Feiner is a research scientist with the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources and the Center for Limnology. His research focuses on fisheries and ecology management, including the impacts of climate change on freshwater fish, angler behavior, and the changing of aquatic ecosystems. He works in temperate lakes and the Great Lakes region combining field research with quantitative analysis and modeling. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Hilary Duggan and Dr. Zach Feiner. Thank you, 
great. I'm just gonna change this over quickly. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Um, happy to be here for Frozen Assets Week. Looking forward to being outside on Sunday or Saturday, not on the ice, but on land talking about limnology. Um, and I'm looking forward to this talk. I think Zach and I are the perfect tag team to tell you all about winter limnology. Um, I've already been asked questions that aren't covered in this talk because there's too much to cover in one hour about everything that happens in lakes in the winter. So um, save up your questions. We're hoping for a good Q&A um, because again, we can't cover everything. Okay, so what's happening beneath the ice? That's uh, the goal of the talk today. Um, introduction kind of explains this. Um, I'm an associate professor at the CFL. I'm interested in how lakes are changing, climate change, water quality, um, and Zach is a fisheries ecologist. Um, so he's going to cover the organisms, and I'm going to cover the water. That's sort of how it breaks down today. Um, Living in Wisconsin, we're familiar with winter lakes. Um, often they look like this, frozen, snow-covered, crisp, cold air temperatures. Um, and some years they look like what we see outside today, which is uh, dark blue, kind of sketchy, unsure if people are walking around and ever survive. Um, so lots of different conditions that we experience in winter. Um, and what we're living through is an, a time of rapid change when it comes to winter. So it's the fastest warming season in Wisconsin, um, by a lot actually, compared to other seasons. Most noticeably, nighttime winter temperatures are not as cold as they used to be. That's the that's sort of the, if you look at climate change, that's what's changing the fastest, winter nights. Um, so this is a, a graph of Wisconsin from Wiki, which is the Wisconsin uh, Impacts on Climate Change group. Um, and you can see that the entire state Winter is significantly warming, more so in the north than in the south. Um, and we're continuing to see this trend, and obviously we're like, living through this this year. And lately, data is brought up a lot when we talk about changing winter. And part of that is because we're lucky enough to have one of the longest records of lake ice dates in the world from Lake Mendota and Lake Monona. Um, and this is a slightly complicated data visualization, but I think it's really uh, useful in terms of seeing how lake ice cover has changed on Lake Mendota since the 1850s. Um, and the top graph is um, kind of shows that back in the 1850s, we had a lot of winters where there was four months of lake ice. Um, Certainly throughout the last century, we've had lots of winters that are three to four months of lake ice. And the last few decades, we're having more winters that are one to two months of lake ice. Um, and it'll be really interesting to see what this winter brings in terms of how long the lake's frozen. Um, and you know, there's lots of variability in this. There's certainly, you can go back in like 1931, it was a super warm winter. Um, you can look at newspaper records where you know, it was January 60 degrees in you know, morning um, So we've had very little in that time, but the length of this record really shows that we're trending towards less lake ice. Um, and luckily we haven't yet experienced a year where the lake doesn't freeze, but that could happen in our future. And lake ice isn't just one thing, there's different forms of lake ice. Um, and so as a researcher, I think a lot too about you know, the lake's frozen, but these frozen conditions are very different than, say, last year's frozen conditions. Um, so right now the lake looks really blue. Um, some years it's covered in feet of snow. So what is the way that change in condition mean for the lake itself? And this is an example of a satellite image of Mendoza from March 2018, where there's no snow, but it looks really sort of blue. Um, and same time in 2019, where the lake looks really white. There's a lot of snow on the lake. So, you know, those conditions are both frozen, but they mean very different things. And so if you think about lake ice quality, it's kind of what we refer to it as, um, we usually break it down into sort of like three components. Uh, the first is being snow. So is there snow on the lake? And we'll talk about why that's important. Um, and then we have these two different forms of ice. We have white ice and black ice. Um, and they're, they're named that because one looks white and one looks black. Um, and white ice, 
is um, in the photo you can see the top there, it's kind of slushy looking. It's often formed from the surface from snow freezing. Um, and so it's very opaque. Uh, light doesn't go through it very easily. Whereas black ice is formed from the water freezing at the bottom of the ice cover. So once you once the lake freezes, that black ice sort of forms at the bottom and gets thicker. Um, and so that black ice is really clear. There's not a lot of air bubbles in it. Um, and so they look very different. So if you if you were to go out, not now, but like in a normal winter, and take an ice core, um, you often see sort of that breakdown, white ice at the top, black ice underneath, um, and there may or may not be snow. Um, and so if we look at a video of black ice, what's really noticeable is that it's incredibly clear. Again, you can actually see gas bubbles trapped in the ice, um, but you can also see in this lake, you know, many meters near the ice, so it's very clear. Um, and this is important because if the ice is really clear, it means that sunlight can pass through it really easily. Um, and so we're going to talk about why that's so important. Um, but stepping back for a minute and thinking about, you know, as people who research lakes, you know, what do we know about winter? Well, first off, we don't know as much about winter as we know about summer, right? Summer's a great time to go out on a boat, take samples. You know, we don't have to teach classes. Students are can work summer jobs. We have a lot of ample resources in the summer to go get samples. Um, and which is harder, right? First of all, we, you know, university schedule is not set up to go do a lot of field work in the winter. Um, conditions aren't as good. You need a lot different gear, right? You can't just take a water sample, which they have an ice auger, drill a hole. You have to be able to be out there in cold conditions. Um, so this is a graph of all of the chlorophyll measurements, so measuring algae that were taken in lakes throughout the year. Um, and what you can see is that there's just very few samples in December through March. So we just, if you just think about all the data that we're knowledge have ever collected, we just haven't taken that many samples in winter. So we don't know as much. Um, that said, we do know quite a bit. Um, and so one thing we're doing now, which is exciting, is we deploy instruments in the winter on the ice. So this is a picture of um, an instrumental buoy. You can see there's a float on the top. It's keeping it sort of floating in the water column. Um, that one has temperature and dissolved oxygen on it. And it measures data throughout the winter. Um, it's still less sophisticated than what we're able to put in lakes in the summer. Um, part of that is because in the summer, you probably, if you've been out on the lake, you can, on the ability to see data buoy, it's this big yellow uh, floating buoy uh, that's recording data. And it has a bunch of solar panels on it. So it is powering itself. Um, and in the winter, we just don't have that capability, right? Like we can't have solar panels in the water. Um, and we can't put things on the surface because the ice will move it around and destroy it. So it's it's still more challenging to get measurements in the winter, but as technology gets better, we are adapting to be able to use that. So this is an example of temperature data collected in 2018 under the ice. Um, what you can see in the fall is the whole lake cooling. It goes from about four degrees Celsius down to almost zero degrees Celsius. Um, at that point, the lake probably flows. And then you'll see this sort of change in those lines. And what's actually happening is the bottom starts to warm up. So once the lake freezes, you actually get heat coming out of the sediment. And the bottom of the lake warms a bit. And the surface stays um, really cold. We also know a lot about organisms. So when we think about like all biology, um, Organisms are adapted to the environments they live in, and that's, you know, things that live in lakes are no exception. So all the organisms that live in lakes in Wisconsin are adapted to life under the ice through, you know, millions of years of evolution. Um, and if we compare aquatic environments to terrestrial environments, it's actually a lot more habitable to be in a lake in winter, right? That lake is not getting colder than zero degrees Celsius, like 32 Fahrenheit. Whereas if you're living on land, you know, you might experience negative temperatures, extremely cold conditions. Um, that's not happening in a lake, right? There's sort of a minimum temperature for liquid water. Um, and so it's, in comparison to land, relatively warm, um, which means if you look at these photos of plants, um, these were taken in the winter 
they're still green, they're still photosynthesizing, they're certainly not growing anywhere near as much biomass as they would in the summer, but they're not kind of like dead the way that you would think of a terrestrial plant being in the winter. Um, and they have unique adaptations for winter, um, but you know they're still very much in plant form. Um, and then things like algae, you can see in the top right, this is actually a photo from a research vessel in Lake Erie. Uh, it's an icebreaker, so the, it's breaking up the ice and the water. It looks kind of brown. I don't know how much you can see that. Um, but that brown water is actually a diatom bloom. So diatoms are algae, so that algae is blooming in Lake Erie in the winter. Um, and that's actually really common in Lake Erie, and sometimes the algae actually attaches to the underside of the ice. Um, so we, they see that a lot. Algae blooming in the winter, diatoms have pretty vital lapses of cold temperatures. Um, and then the bottom left uh, are the pictures from zooplankton. And uh, depending on conditions, sometimes zooplankton just keep on reproducing and growing uh, all winter. Um, sometimes they have resting stages. Um, they can have eggs that go into the sediments. They you know come back when the conditions are good. Um, and some of those um, resting stages can actually just stay there for years. Um, there's there's a whole field of analogy where people resurrect old zooplankton and you know see how things have evolved. Um, so you know all these organisms are adapted to these conditions. Um, and Zach's going to talk a bit more about and specifically about fish. So the the three points that we're going to are going to hit on today is why winter isn't dormant, uh, fishy stuff, and then talk a little bit about changing winters. I feel this diagram up of an aquatic food web, and I'm not going to go through it, but this goes back to sort of uh, you know introductory limnology, thinking about the different levels of the food chain. We have uh, plants and algae in the bottom, we can primary consumer, so things like zooplankton, vertebrates, we have bigger fish, up top we have humans, eating fish, um, and this food web is still active in the winter. None of this kind of shuts down. Things just change a bit. With the one exception of uh, the duck, which usually migrates away. So I crossed the duck out, but everything else is still there, including humans, right? As soon as we know the base, frozen right there, top of the food chain. Um, so all of what we know about summer aquatic ecosystems is still happening in the winter. So thinking about just kind of the physics of a, a lake, um, in the summer, if we think about lake physics, and when I say physics, I just mean like temperature and water movement. Um, we have, you know, wind mechanically mixing the lake with the sun, days are long, lots of solar radiation. Sun is really important for both heat as well as light. So heat for temperature and light for photosynthesis. So algae, plants need light. Um, and then, you know, there's this free exchange of gases with the atmosphere. So um, if there's lots of oxygen in the lake, it goes into the atmosphere. If there's no oxygen in the lake, then oxygen from the atmosphere goes down. So there's lots of just sort of interaction. Um, and the biggest thing about winter is that interaction with the atmosphere is cut off. So the lake freezes, and all of a sudden, we don't have wind mixing. So wind suddenly has no effect, and we don't have that free exchange of gases. Um, and so those two really important processes are cut off. However, uh, we still have the sun, and this is where that idea of like snow and white ice and black ice comes into play. Um, if we have ice cover like we have out there right now, which is there's no snow, uh, very thin ice, very dark in color, that lake is absorbing a lot of solar radiation. So it's gonna be getting heat from the sun, it's also gonna be getting light. So, you know, if you're an algae cell out there, uh, there's plenty of light to be able to photosynthesize. So you can be growing. Um, and that heat actually warms the surface water and causes mixing. So um, as that surface water warms, it has to sink. That warmer water is going to be heavier at those temperatures, and so the lake actually mixes. So that mixing is important for things like oxygen, mixes oxygen around, mixes heat, uh, it mixes nutrients like phosphorus around, and it also will keep cells in suspension. So if you're that algae cell that wants to be at the surface to get light, that mixing is actually going to bring you to the surface. Um, so the sun is really important um, in winter dynamics. 
as well as all of the stored heat from the summer that's stored in the sediment. So the ground is still warm from the summer, and so it's going to actually just be giving off some heat. And so you see over winter is usually the bottom is a little bit warmer because the sediment's giving off heat, um, and that heat also contributes to more mixing. Um, so there's still, you know, we think about lakes being frozen and quiet, but there's still lots of movement going on under the ice. And so um, from this data we collected in Dota, we can see this. Um, so this goes back to this comparison of 2018-2019. So black ice, white ice. Um, and these graphs are showing temperature, chlorophyll, chlorophyll measures algae, um, oxygen, uh, and pH. And what we can see is that in the um, 2018, the black ice here, remember it was warmer, there was more algae, there was more oxygen because algae produce oxygen, um, and the pH was higher. Um, and so all of these changes are happening because of the ice conditions and sun. Um, so it's kind of amazing how you know just having a snow cover or no snow, snow cover can really change uh, what's happening in the lake. And so we actually did this experimentally um, with a couple of collaborators in northern Wisconsin. We did an experiment where we plowed snow off a lake for two whole winters. Which is a lot of plowing. Um, this is not a good lake. And it took, you can see from the sun movement in the sky, how many hours it takes to plow a lake. Um, but this was a really great experiment because you could actually then uh, experimentally prove some of what we were, you know, hypothesizing happens. Um, my dog loved it. She got to come around. She was super unhelpful because she would actually take those big chunks and like put them back on the lake. Um, and so we, we carried up this experiment from 2018 to 2021, um, caught some cool uh, bobcats walking on the lake at one point, um, went out, did a lot of sampling. This was all during COVID, I mean, half of it was during COVID, so um, the university let us drive up there uh, and continue our research, which was great. Um, and what plowing does is, if you have the right conditions, you can get this really nice ice like that's showing the right, which is this really clear ice, um, transmits a lot of light that actually has impacts on temperature, which I'll show. So I'm plowing immediately changed ice conditions. Um, it changed the light, the light went way up under the ice. The light actually got colder initially, and that was because the snow is like a blanket, so snow acts as insulation. So when we need the snow, the lake lost more heat. Um, so the lake got colder. But then there's the switch where, you know, around March, there's enough sun that the lake actually got warmer. Um, chlorophyll went up, so there was more algae. Um, you can actually see how green some of those chlorophyll samples look in the picture. And there are more algae because there's more light. Um, and then actually, the water looked green, which was pretty cool. Um, and again, this is in, you know, February um, in Maine, Wisconsin. Um, so we saw more algae and we saw more zooplankton because as soon as there was food, at the bottom of the food chain, zooplankton were happy, their biomass increased. Um, however, this is a very small lake um, that doesn't have much, much oxygen any time of the year because um, it's got a lot of dissolved, dissolved away carbon. And so there's no, there's, there's no fish in this lake. So we can't really see anything that what happened with fish. Uh, but we certainly had a big impact on the lower part of the food web um, and changing that just by removing that snow, right? So those ice conditions that we're seeing change have a big impact on what's happening in the lake. Um, so we found, you know, plowing snow, we get thicker ice, lake got colder, we definitely have more transfer of energy at the food chain. And the next question from this is then, you know, how, how do our changing winters affect summer? And that's something that I think Zach and I certainly are both interested in um, kind of translating this to the next season. So that's sort of where some of our future research is taking us. Um, but what I haven't told you is how any of this relates to fish, which is always the question I get. So this time I was smart enough to be a fisheries ecologist with me. Um, and so this is where Zach takes over to tell you about fish. All right, Oop. back. 
Okay, cool. cool. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, everybody. So I think that was a really great introduction to what's happening under the ice in lakes, right? And now the question, like Hillary said, is, well, how does this then come back to fish, and how is this influencing what the fish are doing under the ice? And really, what are they doing under there anyway, right? Um, so you know, Hillary showed this really cool plot of water quality measurements. That that's cool. I'm going to do that for fish. So I did the same thing. This is a plot showing. Um, the number of Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources fisheries surveys done over the past 10 years, every day of the year. And it shows you exactly the same problem, right? Doing fisheries research is also hard during the wintertime, right? A lot of really um, innovative uh, methods exist to try and sample fish under the ice. But really, the fact of the matter that it's hard to do, you know, so we, the vast, vast majority of the sampling we do is in the summer months, except for one day, which is July 4th. So we're also patriotic in addition to hardworking. Um, but the idea here is that, you know, there really isn't as much data on what fish are doing under the ice as we have in the summertime. And it's just because it's hard to do. But, you know, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we do know and then um, a little bit about how climate change might be influencing some of those uh, interactions. So the, the issue here is that winter can actually be a pretty tough time for fish, right? It's cold there. It's dark relatively darker than the summer. There's less food, you know, Hillary, I think showed that you can get blooms of stuff, but often it's much less productivity than that, what happens in the summertime, right? So the fish, even if they're adapted to it, they have to figure out ways to thrive and survive. So the question is, you know, how are these fish making it through the wintertime? And the answer at first is, well, some of them don't, right? Fish kills, winter fish kills are actually a really, um, uh, not very common, but they occur every winter in a lot of lakes around the state of Wisconsin. I think a lot of you maybe have either heard about them or, or, or seen them possibly, right? And they can be really dramatic, right? The ice starts to come off the lake and all of a sudden dead fish start popping up on shore. Or you go to ice fishing, you drill a hole, and all of a sudden there's dead fish coming up your hole, right? So I think they get a lot of attention, but it does take certain conditions under which it happens. But mortality is a thing that happens under the ice. Fish can starve. And or the habitat cannot be right, and you can lose fish. And the most dramatic example of this is a fish kill. And where this happens is actually pretty simple. And I think Hillary really set this up really nicely, is that in the summertime, you're getting mixing, you're getting oxygen into your lake, right? And then in the wintertime, you get that layer of ice that stops it mixing, and then you get that layer of snow. And if it's thick enough and dark enough, you can actually prevent uh, sunlight reaching algae and reaching plants. So you're slowing down photosynthesis in the lake you're getting less oxygen into your water. And then those plants and algae start to die. And then bacteria start to consume even more oxygen to break down those plants and algae. So now you have no more extra oxygen getting into the lake, and the stuff that's dead is now breaking down, you're losing all of your oxygen. And in a shallow lake that can be very productive, you can actually run out of oxygen in your water. And then fish need oxygen to live, and then you have a winter fish kill. In lakes that kill very often where we don't want that to happen, well, actually, you know, in some lakes, we don't have any fish. Hillary's Lake, that where they plowed the, the snow off is a great example. That lake has no oxygen in the wintertime, and you only get a couple of small mid -minnow, mud minnows that can survive those low oxygen conditions. In other lakes, we can have really uh, extreme and ambitious management uh, uh, interventions. So this is Big O Plain Reservoir in Wisconsin. This is a place that had uh, winter killed multiple times. So we decided to get some more air into the lake. And that's exactly what we did. These are aerators, multiple aerators across this long reservoir. And we're actually pumping air into the lake. And it keeps it from freezing, so so much for ice fishing, but it keeps it from winter killing. And that can keep those fish communities thriving, um, even in very harsh winter conditions. But we know, you know, not all fish die, right? Or else we'd, I'd be insane to go out and freeze my tail end off every winter ice fishing, right? We know people are out there catching fish. We know they're there in the springtime. So the question then becomes, well, what else are they doing? What other adaptations do fish have in the wintertime to help them survive what can be a pretty harsh period um, of the year? So the first thing they can do is just chill out, right? There are a lot of species, particularly warm water species like bluegill or largemouth bass, some of your other kind of uh, centralic uh, sunfish species, that because fish are cold blooded, they actually kind of slow down their metabolism, they eat less, and they actually lose weight. They kind of starve during the wintertime. So they use some reserves they build up during the summer to kind of make it through this colder period. And that's what this plot on the left is showing that blue box is winter. And it's just showing the consumption and the growth and the metabolic rate of these bluegill really slow down. Uh, in, in the winter time, and growth actually drops down below zero, so they're actually losing weight. So they kind of go and they hunker down and they just make it through the winter. They're not hibernating per se, but they're just kind of operating at a slower and lower rate. 
The next thing the fish can do is try to move, right? They're not a plant. They're not stuck somewhere where they just, if it doesn't work, they die, right? They can go and find different habitats. Um, one example of this, uh, again, is in Bluegill. This is a, a really cool project where they actually tagged Bluegill with little radio transmitters and then put out a whole bunch of receivers all over the lake so they could actually follow the Bluegill around. They ping off these transmitters. Um, it's very, very neat uh, research. And what they found is that in the top map there, um, this is a lake in South Dakota, the bluegill actually all pile into this bay. So think of the Bay, for example, right? It's shallow. And the thing about this bay, it's a little bit shallower and it's got lots and lots of plants. So right away, you have habitat. If you're not going to want to be moving around very much, you can snuggle into those plants and you're good, right? The other thing is if it's a little bit shallower and there's plants, as long as there's light, you can have photosynthesis and oxygen. And that can be a pretty good place to hang out if you're a bluegill in the, in the winter time. On the bottom map there, it shows those bluegill then just explode all over the lake in the summer. Now they can go and exploit lots of different habitats, lots of different depths, different ha uh, and, and, and uh, find food in good temperature, and they're happy. So you're really locating places where you can overwinter, and that's the main thing for these fish. Another great example of this is actually perch in Mendota. So if you ever look way the heck out in the middle of Lake Mendota and you see a shanty and you think what crazy person went all the way out there, that's a, probably a perch fisherman. So what those perch are actually doing is if you look at the map in the, the corner there, they're going out to the very deepest parts of the lake. We're talking 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 feet down. And the reason is because of what Hilly said earlier, they're actually getting bottom heating. And those perch are actually going into those warmer bottom habitats. The lake is mixing, so it's getting oxygen down there. The perch are feeding on uh, insects and stuff in the bottom. And they're down in actually a little bit warmer water. So it allows them to kind of keep their kind of metabolic processes going all winter long. Right. So again, this idea of you can move and you can find these pockets of habitat that are still pretty nice for you, even though it's really cold in a lot of other places. So the last thing the fish can do is love the cold, right? So we have some cold water specialists in Wisconsin. One of them is this boat here. Uh, boat is actually a freshwater cod. So they're actually really, really tasty. Don't judge a book by its cover because they're not the prettiest thing you've ever seen, right? But they love the cold and they love the dark. They're actually kind of a winter specialist. Um, so a place that has burbot, for example, in Wisconsin would be Devil's Lake actually has a burbot population down there and, and people fish for them in the springtime. Um, so what these fish with this plot on the bottom is showing is a kind of a whole range of different burbot. Again, this is somebody putting tags and fish and falling around. It's really cool. But the idea is that in the summertime, these fish are actually kind of hunkered down. They don't really like the light. They move a little bit at night, but it's too warm. They're not, not a fan. And then you can see as the fall and then in the winter, which is like gray box progresses, you get a lot more movement of these fish. So they're actually coming in and exploiting habitats that other rainwater fish might move out of. So it's a really cool kind of transition of different species using different habitats from season to season. So if you it, the cold doesn't bother you anyway, right? They love it, yeah. And my true world is the other way moon that I managed to get Allison into a science talk. So we have lots and lots of different strategies for how fish can um, uh, respond to the winter. And a lot of it is based on what their thermal preferences are, cold water versus warm water, what habitat is available, and what their kind of tools are to be able to exploit those habitats. So the second thing we want to talk about is a little bit about the fish uh, reproduction in the winter time. So when it was actually a really, really important time for um, setting up how well fish are able to reproduce and make baby fish. So on the one hand, we have a number of species that are kind of uh, fall spawning species. And a lot of these are, are kind of very cool um, native uh, Selmata and, and Corrigonid species. So things like Cisco, like whitefish. If you're ever eating a fish boil in Door County, you're eating whitefish probably. Um, lake trout is another one. These fish will actually spawn in the fall, right as the ice is going on. It's like November, December. And then the ice operates as this really important barrier to stabilize that under uh, ice environment for their eggs. So there's been really interesting research out of Lake Michigan, uh, Lake Whitefish, where these fish will actually go in, they'll spawn, and if they have the ice cover, you have a really nice, stable, calm, peaceful environment for your eggs. And your eggs are developing all the winter long and they hatch in the spring. If you lose that ice cover, wind, storms, you know, that meat is Gerald, right? You lose, you have a lot of um, uh, dislodging of those eggs, potential suffocation of those eggs. You'll actually see worse year classes, so less production of lake white fish in years where you don't have as much ice. So it shows how important that just having that ice cover, having these cold winters can be for the production of fish. On the flip side, we also have spring spawning fish. And I think we do a lot of the kind of like Mount Rushmore fish in Wisconsin, right? Like walleye, perch, stuff like that. We fish that spawn right in the spring, walleye like to spawn right when the ice goes out. 
And what's interesting about them is when they're allocating energy to their eggs is during the winter time. So what this plot is showing is actually um, the proportion of a walleye's uh, body weight that's made up of ovaries. So when you see it on the Y axis, it gets like 25 or 30 percent. So like, you know, if you can think about a human carrying around like a 25 or 30 pound baby when they're pregnant, right? Like that's how much energy these fish are putting into making eggs. Um, and all of that energy allocation is happening during the winter. What that's what that blue box is showing. So they're going from a little tiny skinny walleye in the fall, and by the end of the fall, there's a great big fat ready to spawn female, right? They're full of eggs, they're ready to go, and all of that's happening during the winter time. So one question that we have is like, well, how, then what does the that little temperature mean, or what does the winter mean for how that energy moves around in a fish? Like, what is the physiology? Because that energy is coming from their fat reserves in their body. They're really not eating a ton in the winter time, so they're just moving stuff around kind of internally, right? So we actually designed an experiment, and I'm going to spare you a lot of the really gory details, where we held perch at three different temperatures, 13, 8, and 4 degrees Celsius. It was a little bit of kind of grad school uh, MacGyver because we had to build an entire experimental unit inside a walk-in freezer to have winter. So you had to go in and bundle up to go in and check your fish and feed them and stuff like that. Um, we were able to do it, and at the end of the year, we spawned these perch out. So that photo on the, um, uh, on the far right here is... Um, me squeezing the eggs out of a perch. Perch are really cool. This is an aside, but they spawn like a really long ribbon, a skein of eggs. It can be like four feet long. And they drape it over vegetation and stuff like that. And it keeps the eggs aerated and off the, the bottom sediment. Um, and like I said, I'm going to spare you a lot of the, the you know, um, biochemical analysis. But what we found is that the colder winter is actually, the perch actually produce higher quality eggs. The combination of fatty acids and oils and things that were in those eggs actually promoted larval survival and growth. Um, of the baby fish that hatched. So again, you know, we think of winter as this really cold, miserable time, but really important things are happening. And a lot of these fish are adapted. They need those cold winters to be able to pull off good year classes and actually have good reproductive success. So you know, this leads us back to kind of what we started to talk with, right? And a lot of what I've kind of had conversations with folks here today is like how weird this ice season is, you know? And there's a ton of data, again, Mendoza is a great example of it, that ice season is getting shorter and ice off is getting earlier. And this is a really great visualization. So ice um, off is on the bottom, ice off is on the top, and you can see it's essentially pinching your ice season. We're getting less and less ice over time. But one of the other things I wanted to point out is that ice is also getting really unpredictable in recent years. So this is taking really similar data now. Where we're just kind of estimating kind of how variable it is from year to year. How much bouncing back and forth do we have from year to year? And all I really want to take you I want you to take away from this plot is that the ice off is getting more and more variable over time. And a great example of this is actually from 10 years ago, 2012 and 2013. So in 2012. The folks up at Trout Lake had to abruptly end their winter winter sampling when they put a truck through the ice in February, right? February. This is like you should be able to drive a tank on the ice in February up north, right? So the ice went out on in 2012 on March 20th. It's one of the earliest ice offs on record. And then one year later, the ice didn't go off until May 10th. It was a super, super late one. So students were wrapping up their semester, they're going up north to start their summer field season, and there's still ice on the lake there's still snow on the ground, right? So it's a really good example of this kind of whiplash effect. One year to the next is almost two months difference in when the ice went off back and forth. So this is a right? A lot of times we think about this should be predictable, you know? We think that by after Christmas, we should be able to go ice fishing. And if you're not paying attention and you march out there, you might have a problem. We just see your stories every single winter about folks need to be rescued off the ice. Things are getting more and more unpredictable. You can't just assume Frozen Estes Festival, but there's going to be ice on the lake around the 5 day on in January, late January, which is crazy, right? Like, it, you have to start thinking about it now. So um, the question then becomes, is this bad, this bad for people? Is it also bad for um, plants and animals? And I'm going to give you one example of why it can be bad, which is the idea of uh, mismatches. So the idea here is that in lakes, you kind of, they kind of count on a uh, steady progression of events, right? The ice goes off. You get sunlight and heat, you get algae, the zooplankton hatch, and they eat the algae, and they're happy, and then the fish hatch, and they eat the zooplankton, and they're happy, and everything kind of works. Energy flows through that food web, right? So what can happen, say we slide ice off way off to the left here, and it starts super early. 
And now you have an algae bloom. And maybe that algae peaks and starts to decline before the zooplankton hatch. So now you have less food for the zooplankton. And then the fish hatch, and there's no food around. So none of the fish survive, and the ones that do don't grow as well, right? So this is called a mismatch. You don't have a good linkage between the production of food and the production of predators, essentially. And you're really um, breaking up the linkages between different components of the food web when that can happen. So one thing we asked at the CFL as well, if we're having all of these kind of whiplash events back and forth, and we think those might be contributing to mismatches because an earlier and a late year could be bad, are walleye experiencing phenological whiplash, right? Are they kind of having a hard time dealing with all the stuff that they're really not adapted to deal with because they're used to having pretty stable, predictable uh, ice off season? So we looked at this in a couple of different ways. The first thing we just looked at how fast ice off is changing versus how fast walleye spawning timing is changing. Um, so this plot is just showing kind of on the x-axis here, on the y-axis is day of year. So it's the time kind of peak walleye spawning, the time the ice went out on a bunch of different lakes in Wisconsin and Minnesota. And what we found is that actually walleye are not tracking climate trends at all. They're starting to fall further and further behind ice off over time. Ice off is changing about four times faster, three and a half times faster than walleye spawning phenology is changing. This is a big deal. So this means walleye is not equipped to keep up with the rate of climate change essentially in our lakes in terms of their spawning, uh, spawning timing. And the second thing we ask is essentially, well, what does this mean for baby walleye, right? So I talked about mismatch, mismatch stuff, and you know, what does this mean for those walleye that have been hatching out into these weird environments in the spring? So here on the x-axis, just to kind of set you up before I throw a funky plot at you, is we just index mismatch as the number of days kind of either early or late that walleye spawning happen different from average. So if you're 30 days different or 30 days late, you're just kind of at 30 on this x-axis. And the y-axis is just the number of baby walleye that we see in our DNR surveys in the fall, which is kind of how we index how good of a year class it's been. And it will show like the two kind of observed points and the black line is the average line. But the main thing I want to point out and I think it jumps out really clearly, but just to highlight it, is that there are no points in the top right of this plot, right? When it's a bad uh, or very uh, off year, you don't get any walleye recruits. And you only get lots of walleye recruits, lots of baby walleye, when spawning happens pretty close to average. So it's a really strong signifier. I think it's close to a smoking gun that match, match mismatch dynamics are at play here, right? Funky uh, phenology, funky springtime ice off is leading to kind of poor walleye recruitment. So just kind of like quickly summarize that, you know, these extremes are exacerbating these mis mismatches for uh, little walleye. And to add on to that, they're not able to keep up with the rate of climate change. So we've got two things happening here that might be con continuing to kind of risk our fishery, this really important uh, fishery for Wisconsinites. So to kind of wrap up, you know, what do we want to take you, what, want you to take away from this talk? I think the first one is that winter in lakes is super dynamic. You look out at a lake and it's frozen and cold and you think, oh, there's nothing going on there. No, but it's actively responding to what the ice is like and what the algae are doing and what the temperatures are like. Fish are moving around or, or um, maybe some fish really like it, right? The lake is alive during the winter and there's all this stuff going on. A lot of it's driven by what the ice and snow is doing, as Hillary showed. And the fact is that organisms are adapted to this life under the ice, right? They wouldn't be there if they weren't able to handle months under snow and ice and cold temperatures and have different ways, either physiologically or kind of physically, to move around to, uh, to handle that. And the issue that we now face is that climate change is probably going to be changing how these lake ecosystems work. In southern Wisconsin, we might be moving to a future where we don't necessarily have ice every year, right? That's a totally different landscape than what we have right now. So there are lots of questions about how climate change is going to change both the kind of lake physics, but also the ecology and the biology of how the, these different organisms, organisms have to adapt um, to these changing conditions. Um, so with that, you know, I want to thank everybody for being here, and I'm sure Hillary thanks you as well, and um, hopefully we have lots of time for questions. And yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Hillary, thank you. We do have plenty of time for questions. We'll ask if you do have any questions, uh, please feel free to raise your hand. I know we also have folks uh, streaming, so we do not. Never mind. Dana takes that back. But if anyone has questions later, we do have an email address to get to. Yes. Thanks. Well, what's the difference between the diatom and plankton? Um, so di diatoms are one basically like family of plankton. So you can think of 
uh, plankton being equivalent to, and so with phytoplankton, because there's also zooplankton, but phytoplankton are uh, small organisms that photosynthesize. They're kind of, you know, the generic term for what might on land is just be plants. Um, and diatoms are one family. So you can think of diatoms being equivalent to, um, you know, like oak trees, for instance. Um, and within that, there's different species. So we kind of group things into these families because they have certain traits that are similar. Um, but we see diatoms, they're a type of phytoplankton that's really common in the winter and spring and fall. They like cold temperatures um, and they, they do well in those conditions. I'm going to take a little bit of liberty here. I want to talk a little about uh, ice kindling that we had that conversation earlier because I find it fascinating. And please, you know, think of some questions uh, for yourselves uh, as we might can go around. Sure. So I guess uh, who's heard of ice candling? Is that a term that anyone's familiar with? A couple of people. Um, so ice candling is, uh, comes up a lot in the spring. Um, and this is often related to the question of, is there a lake ice safe to walk on? Because usually in the fall, and sorry, in early winter and midwinter, we think about ice safety being related to how many inches of ice there are. So the thicker the ice, the safer it is. But when ice starts melting, um, and it's probably happening right now, um, the vertical structure of ice is much stronger than the horizontal structure. And so once water starts penetrating the ice, which is what's happening now, um, you get more melting along the vertical planes. And so the ice can be quite thick, but it can basically form these really long crystals that have no horizontal structure. So you could step on it and you know, it could be seven inches thick and you're looking the right through because there's no horizontal strength. Um, and so if you were to pick up a block of ice, sometimes it just looks like, it's called candles, it looks like, like tapers, like the long candles, it basically falls into these sort of long cylindrical structures. So that's called ice candling. And it's, uh, it's important to know about in the spring when maybe ice is thick, but it's certainly not safe because it has no horizontal structure. Um, I have a YouTube video on it if you want to check it out. Uh, I mean, I, it, it's, it's hard. You can often tell at the shore. So when you're like at the shore, if you actually just like took the ice and you just get, you know, it moves a lot, shatters, falls apart. It's pretty obvious. Um, you know, the, you often get it happening more at the shore. So sometimes the edge is more dangerous than further out. Um, but again, like, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit risk averse on walking on lakes when they look dark blue like they currently do, although there was lots of people on it today, so, well. I'm wondering if the uh, snow and ice cover that is shrinking over a shorter period of time now, whether that impacts what we're going to see the next summer in terms of our phosphorus loading in the lakes. Is that yeah correlation? So we're starting to look into that. Um, there certainly theoretically should be a correlation because if you're getting these earlier algorithms or earlier winter, or algorithms like under the ice, those algae are going to be taking up phosphorus. Um, and when it's sort of cycling internally, so um, it'll be interesting to see whether or not if you, as you get more spring and summer algae, do you actually get less of the sort of like spring peak? Um, and yeah, we're not really sure about that yet, but we do see in years with really clear ice, um, you can see sort of drawdowns in phosphorus and silica, these, these elements that um, algae are using up. Um, but yeah, they don't have quite enough, they don't have quite enough winter and spring data really to like be able to like fully answer that. But theoretically, yeah, it should definitely have an impact. Uh, I had a quick question about the um, fish eggs. Uh, I forget which species it was, but the walk-in freezer study. Um, you mentioned that there was biochemistry about lower temperatures leading to higher quality eggs. Is that a question of quality or quantity? And could you maybe just go into a little bit of the biochemistry about that? If that's sure. Too much trouble? Yeah, yeah. I'll let you. Um, yeah, so we uh, 
did this uh, uh, experiment and then we looked at the fatty acid composition of the eggs. So fatty acids, if you take like fish oil supplements or heard of those, like DHA, EPA, the whole alphabet soup, there's a whole, like there's 58 of them that I think we looked at. Um, and the idea is that there's been a lot of studies that uh, more uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids, so long chains of like, so that's your DHA, EPA, that's in your fish oil tablet. Those are actually uh, improved larval survival and growth. Um, and then other kinds of like short monosaturated fatty acids or saturated fatty acids are associated with kind of poor larval survival and growth. So um, what we looked at was essentially those fatty acids. And when we looked at the total composition of fatty acids across the three treatments, we found that the 13C and the 8C were pretty similar. And the 4C is right over here and had a lot more of those polyunsaturated fatty, fatty acids in it as kind of a percentage of the composition. So that led us to kind of uh, theorize that then those are actually higher quality eggs. We didn't have the, the gumption to go all the way through and try and hatch those eggs out right, as part of that experiment. But the idea is that they're actually, um, you know, because of the, the temperature, you're actually getting mobilizations of different kinds of fatty acids into eggs from your um, your body fat source, essentially. So we didn't find any effect on the for hundreds or number of eggs. We didn't really find much of an effect on um, things like the quality of the skein that came out of the perch, right? It really was just in the kind of composition. I don't think we found any effect those on egg size either. So it was really about what those eggs were made out of and less about kind of how they looked, which is pretty interesting. Yeah. I've heard fish taste better in the winter because of fatty acids. Is that true? <laughs> I, I think we should design a study. <laughs> and uh, I, I have also, I have also hear probably here at the summer. In the summer, fish are mushy kind of idea. In the winter, like the, the fat flesh is firmer. I don't know if that's because you catch a fish in the summer and it's dangling in like warm water on your stringer all day and then it's kind of gross versus like being able to basically flash freeze it on a cold day. So, yeah, let's, let's design that. Yeah. So, well, with the decrease in the number of fish because of the climate change, do you think the DNR will respond and decrease the amount of fish that fishermen can catch or fish? Thank you. Yeah, this, well, there are lots of things that the DNR can do to respond to those kinds of issues. And what, what we do is we really respond, try and be flexible in our response into how the populations are doing. Um, so, for example, on um, for water. You know, it's not just kind of climate change, it's also issues with like invasive species and, and other things. There's lots of stressors on walleye. Um, competition with warm water species like bass is another issue. Um, so in a lot of walleye lakes, we have reduced uh, bag limits and, and harvest rates and stuff like that. Um, you know, there's a lot of questions about how do we respond to these these broad scale, big broad scale changes in fish communities, you know, how you get deal with a fishery that's probably changing in some lakes that are getting warm up too much for these cold water, cold water species to, you know, take advantage of your walleye and bass and maybe you accept that there's going to be less walleye. In other places, there might be kind of bright spots that are going to hold on to these cold water fisheries and maybe those are the ones that you can really focus on preserving and stuff. So there are lots of uh, decisions to make about kind of um, what species you're managing for and how to manage them. But climate change is, you know, a stressor that we definitely take into account in terms of how it affects overall abundance of our fish. Yeah. So I heard that your lakes are getting saltier. So how saltier will your lakes be in the coming years or months? Yeah, so I was expecting someone to ask me a question about salt. Um, but uh that's a challenging question because each lake's different. Um, but one thing I didn't talk about, but I want to talk about is the fact that lakes get saltiest in the winter because of road salt. Um, and Zach was showing this idea that fish move to a good habitat, and often that's at the bottom of the lake where it's warmer from the sediments, um, but that's also where salt likes to go. Um, so it's an additional, like Zach just talked about, these multiple stressors that lakes are experiencing, and that's another one, which is if the bottom of the lake is really salty, um, but it's also the place that was the warmest, you know, you then lose that habitat um, because the fish isn't going to want to hang out in saltier water. Um, and so that's another concern in winter that doesn't happen in summer because it'll just, it mixes out in the spring. Um, so it's kind of unique to winter. That's another research proposal. Yeah. yeah. Um, you talked about how the walleye are 
essentially not keeping up with the, the change in the temperature regime. Mm -hmm. And basically the lakes, lake ice happening earlier and earlier. Um, it, I mean, do you assume, or is there knowledge that, that they're, the timing of their spawning is, is it photo period? I mean, is that the primary driver? Yeah, I have a whole number to talk about that. But yeah, the idea is yeah. that um, they're keen on both temperature and photo period keys. And it's really, it's a really interesting interaction between well, like yeah. essentially they won't wait forever for the temperatures to get right. And eventually they just go. And so they, um, it's that combination of photo period and, and um, temperature that they're using. And that photo period key was actually keeping them from just Right. Exactly. So would you expect over time that they would, you know, sort of learn uh, there would be some sort of adjustment um, independent of the photo period to account for the, the temperature going up? Sure. Yeah. So that's a good point. So photo period for folks that, I mean, I know it's just day length. So, you know, 14 hours a day photo kind of thing um, in the springtime. So the short answer is yes, they can evolve to track the longer answer is they can't evolve faster than climate is changing so evolution takes time right it takes like mutations and selection and um the pace of change that we're experiencing is much faster than that ev the, the evolutionary capability probably is so it's it's um it could happen but it's not something that's going to be able to uh, compensate for how fast things are changing yes <clears throat> Hi, thank you. Um, can you speak to the correlation between snow and ice amounts and subsequent lake levels uh, the following summer generally? Yeah, so it's sometimes it's a little lake specific. We hear about it with the Great Lakes a lot, which is how much ice cover there is and what the water level is. Um, in part because the Great Lakes are so big that when they're not ice covered, you have a lot of evaporation. And so if the Great Lakes are open water, you're losing a lot of water all winter. Whereas if they're ice cover, that evaporation rate, there's still evaporation, but it's a lot less. Um, and so there's a, a really strong correlation with the Great Lakes between ice cover and, and, and water levels. Um, also, the Great Lakes have a really small watershed, so the snow cover, the amount of snow that falls surrounding them is important for sort of replenishing that water in the spring. Um, there's, you know, that, and that's true of most lakes, which is, the, you know, on average, if we went back in time, usually you get a lot of snow in the winter, that snow loses lake levels in the spring. Um, so we do see, you know, if we have a winter with no snowpack, lower water levels, um, or a winter like last year where I don't think like it snowed every Thursday and then it would just melt. So you know, we had snow and it was gone and the snow and it was gone. So there wasn't really a big snowpack in the spring, um, but there was a lot of snow. And so sort of when that snow falls and melts um, contributes to water level. Um, and then we also manage a lot of water levels. So for Mendota, you know, it gets drawn down in the fall to keep it lower in the winter to in you know to be able to get higher in the spring. Like there's an expectation that it's going to go up. So. The human decision making aspect of a lot of lakes comes into play there too with water level because we manage we manage so many water levels um, that you know our decisions change that correlation. Um, and then as you move into more, you know, northern Wisconsin where we're not managing lake levels as much, um, groundwater is a big contributor to lake levels as well. So it's sort of there's really Fascinating answers to that question, but it's kind of lake specific. With that. All right, I think we're going to do these last two and then wrap things up. Hi, thanks. Great talk. Um, I was curious about the effect of cloud cover kind of affecting the dark lake with snowpack or without, because I imagine when it's warmer, there's going to be perhaps more clouds, which might affect radiation, which might then affect the cascade to the lake temperatures and things like that. Yeah, that's a great question. Cloud cover uh, is exactly what you said, which is if it's cloudy, there's way less solar radiation. Um, so I do a lot of work in Antarctica, which is um, a place that's actually usually very sunny. Um, and you can see as soon as it's cloudy, 
you know, the air temperature is way down, the amount of light reaching the lake is way down. So it has sort of dramatic effects as soon as there's cloud cover. Um, it's also something that is challenging. Um, like when I try and do modeling work, um, cloud cover data is uh, just a little bit harder to work. Like it's harder to get your hands on than air temperature data, for instance. Um, and so we don't always have uh, the best knowledge of sort of what cloud cover is, how fast it's changing, but you know, it can go, it can be very, very variable, even like on parts of the lake. Like you can look at a Mendota and see that half of it's cloud covered and the other half sunny. And so, you know, what's happening on one side is different than the sum, um, than the other. So um, yeah, there's a lot of interesting feedback to cloud cover um, and it gets kind of complex and like how quickly it changes, yeah. Um, I was just curious, uh, do you actually think it's that realistic that uh, the time might be coming when Wisconsin lakes will uh, not ice over at all? I mean, look what happened this month. I mean, people were saying that maybe uh, extended sub-zero weather was a thing of the past, and then look at the well, middle of January, what happened here. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, we probably can both answer this, but... Um... It's some, you know, that question's a good one to end on, which is sort of what to expect in the future. And at the same time that winters are overall warmer, we also now have these polar vortex events that weren't common in the past. And that's because of Arctic warming that's pushing the jet stream down. So we both have warmer winters and also uh, more frequent extreme cold snaps. So um, I would say the chances are pretty low that we're not going to have that we're gonna have a whole winter with no lake ice because I think the chances of like we've been having at least one polar vortex event every winter for the last like number of years. So well, what we saw this winter was it only took, you know, five days to freeze the lake. And then once it froze, it stays frozen. Like that lake ice is pretty tenacious. It's been pretty warm and it's just still there. So um I think you know the those the global weather patterns are having a really interesting impact too on our on those winter temps. I don't know. Do you have a but <laughs> I think I would agree with that I think the issue is probably that potential for kind of more intermittent ice, like right, freeze, thaw, freeze again, maybe thaw, partially thaw, freeze again, right? And so those kinds of dynamics, because that actually can really influence um uh your limnology and your your planking communities as well, right? You kind of lose the ice for a while, then you actually can sometimes get um you lose even more heat from your lake and you end up with a colder lake because you don't have ice cover. Um, so you can have really different dynamics in a lake that stays frozen versus a lake that kind of bounces back and forth. And I think, um, so it's possible that we, they're not necessarily going to always lose ice, but it's possible we might have more years where we have kind of like weird intermittent ice, like yeah. you can go to do that 20, 20. Yeah, that's a great example. Yeah. So you have like these, it's no longer like freezes. Great. Now I have a messy data set where I have multiple free ice thaw dates that I have to figure out, right? That kind of thing. We don't know how to plot that yet. We're not yeah. used to it. <laughs> it's supposed to be very clean and pretty and now it's getting messy. Yeah. Awesome. Exactly. Thank you so much. Yeah. We did have a few other hands. I saw if we did not get to your question, please feel free to send an email to Clean Lakes Alliance. It's info at cleanlakesalliance.org. They will work to make sure that you get the information that you're asking for. Somehow I'll try to connect you uh, with Hillary and Zach. If you are interested in our next talk, it is February 14th, Valentine's Day, and we are talking about love in the lakes, reproductive health of, of plants and animals and all that's going on in the water on Valentine's Day. So that is our next 101 event. Uh, coming up next, though, here in the next about 30 seconds, if you want to come on up to the seventh floor, we do have a nice happy hour, a mix and mingle, a good opportunity to ask questions or just continue on this conversation. Your drink ticket is good for one beer, one wine, or one soda, if that's your drink of choice this evening. Um, I was told that uh, James is picking up everyone's martinis. I think that's the game plan. <laughs> One beer, one wine, or one soda. $35 donation. I'll buy That's it. <laughs> but, thank you so much for your time. Again, we will see you either upstairs or on Valentine's Day, y'all.